Shivi, thank you for joining me. You're looking very glamorous this morning. Oh, thank you for, for saying that, Maria. With uh, two toddlers under the age of three and a half, that's not always easy to do, but uh, I'm always super hyper and energized, and I think that that's the A game I try and bring to everything. <laughs> I, think, I think it helps with, yeah, it's brilliant. I think it helps when you're really passionate about what you do. And, and that actually brings me to my very first question. What did you want to be when you were growing up as a child? What was your, what was the plan? So interestingly enough, my mum and dad always say that it really surprised them how much clarity I had about what I wanted to do. And, and the fact that I ended up actually, actually following that very much that exact path. We was, was actually quite a bit of a surprise because it doesn't often go hand in hand. So I'd say probably as young as I want to say eight or 10, not that I knew I was going to be a speaker or anything, but at that point, I remember hoisting my father's at that point, massive, unwieldy, sunny uh, camera on my little shoulders and just wanting to kind of interview anyone I could get my hands on. Um, and at that point, I was this very voracious, vivacious, um, kind of mischievous uh, 10 year old. And so it was a little bit more fun. But I think as the years went on, and I was sort of 13, 14, I had a very clear defined view that I wanted to be a storyteller, and either a journalist, because that seemed quite accessible. And I thought that's a great way to, to tell objective stories as well. Um, or indeed, as a broadcaster, because I thought that was something that came to me naturally, and I wanted to do it. So I was recording video after video, writing article after article every week. Um, and so it was very clear to me that I wanted to be in the business of media. And it turned out that I ended up, you know, getting a journalism gig at 16 to be the youth reporter at the Times of India. Um, and then it just took off from there and started doing some really interesting broadcasting on technology. And then the futurism stuff, I'm sure we'll talk about that in, in a bit. That's something I sort of fell into later on. Uh, but it was very clear to me as a 10 year old with those little kind of pigtails swinging around exactly what I wanted to do. That's fantastic to have that clarity. I still don't know what I want to do, so I'm impressed with that. You're already doing it though, honestly. <laughs> yeah, but so you're ahead of your time. That's really brilliant. So actually the future bit and the tech bit, where did that come from? You said you fell into it. I mean, that's a strange thing to fall into. Yeah, though. yeah, Especially yeah. Especially as a is. woman, yeah? Well, exactly. So what ended up happening was, I want to say, first of all, I you know, was born and brought up in India. So I was in Bangalore till I was 23. Bangalore itself, has luxury, you know, as far as two decades ago, even of being a natural Asia hub. It was a kind of known as the Silicon Valley of India. So I'd say instantly I was surrounded by the headquarters of the IBMs and, and all the big companies. And so a lot of the, the, the stuff that made it into the local press ended up actually being about business technology and science. And so I started doing a lot of thinking, I'd suppose, about what's at the intersection of science and technology. That's what I kind of honed in on. And ended up moving to the UK on a scholarship and fellowship and started reporting actually on business, then did business and tech, then did business tech and science. And then I found that a lot of the pieces I were doing, I was getting asked to do more pieces uh, on future gazing. So I reported for CNN Asia and Reuters for a while as a freelancer in the UK when I started out. And I just found that those were the pieces that were lighting my fire, trying to envision what's next and kind of igniting that imaginative part of my brain. So not having to separate that creative thinking from the objective storytelling really appealed to me. And so in the nature of my work, I suppose, Marie, I did end up doing futuristic kind of forward thinking writing, but it was still not pure futurism. I then found, because I was on the speaking circuit, that a lot of what people were asking about was, can you tell us what's next? And that sort of, I fell into it because it became my bag. It became my thing. And again, there are very, very few, I would say, you know, female futurists who do this professionally for a living. Um, and it just so happened that I was chatting to someone from the MIT. I've told the story on stage once. And he said, what do you do? This is before. I was a futurist. Um, and I said, this is what I do. I predict what's about to come. I do a lot of rigorous research. I'm really geeky. And I find these patterns and I try and envision what's actually going to happen next. And, and it, it's something that, for example, doesn't even exist now. And then I try and put that forward. And, you know, a significant number of 
stuff I put out there has ended up materializing, which is a really good feeling. So I thought, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this stuff. Um, and he went, oh, you're a futurologist. And I thought, oh, that sounds really vain. It just sounds like I'm saying I know all, or I'm this, you know, I have a stack crystal ball, which is just impossible, but it just stuck. And in the speaking circuit, it's quite helpful when people can actually sort of get a sense of what you do. And so I just started getting called a futurist. And that's why I said I fell into it. And when I joined the London Speaker Bureau, um, you guys loved the term because it, it, it clearly qualifies to someone what this person does. And so to be able to be um, a young woman in futurism, I think, has been really fantastic. And it's also actually opened this really interesting avenue of a lot of women at events coming up to me and going, that's fascinating. How did you do this? How can I do this? Um, or men coming up and saying, wow, this is really interesting. You don't often you know, see a futurologist talking about science and technology and business and you know, consumer psychology. Can I try to fuse them all into one? No, that's fantastic. And you're absolutely right when it comes to bureaus and clients. We need to know where you fit and we need to be able to understand you really clearly and easily. So thank you for that, for making it easy. <laughs> but you mentioned there aren't many, many women, although more women are getting interested in it. Yeah. And actually some of our most successful female speakers, and you are one of those, okay. are looking at future. So it's a big topic. Everybody wants to know. Why do you think, uh, well, in fact, let's rephrase that. What are your views on the diversity in mm. tech and in future? Mm. What, what do you think about what's going on? Yeah. So Maria, I guess if we talk about sort of uh, the playing field in the wider tech industry, so not just, let's say, female speakers or futurists, um, but the actual, the coders, the engineers, the scientists, um, and, and, and even, in fact, graduates from computer science degrees, the founders of, of tech companies, there is still a significant disparity. I think the last time I heard some of the stats, it was still, you know, 17 to 18 percent only uh, representation of women in the industry. I think there's a couple of things here because I do I do mentor about four or five young women who are aspiring techies. One I think one reason for that is. There's a gender inequity that actually filters in very early on when you're 14, 15, 16, those formative years when you're in school and you're trying to work out which stream to kind of pursue. And that often segues into perhaps the degree you do if you choose to do a bachelor's degree and then whether you do a master's or not is up to you. But that pivotal point early on is where we still have very little intervention from both parents as well as educators. That's slowly changing, and I can speak mainly for the UK where you have coding as part of the curriculum. But technology and that sector isn't always made out to be, frankly, as accessible and as fantastic as it actually is. Um, so the problem is it almost reinforces those gender stereotypes of, ooh, if you're a woman in tech, you're gonna have a really hard time. And you know, personally, I haven't come up against those issues. And I meet many young women and mature women in tech who actually haven't had a super rough time. Yes, you are often the only woman in the room. That's changing now. Uh, but I think sometimes as women, we count ourselves out of that role before we even put ourselves forward. So some of it, I think it's vested in women not necessarily wanting to put themselves forward for some of these roles um, or having a confidence issue. But the other is that is a gender inequity, there just is. It's, you see it in hiring patterns. A lot of people wanna hire, and this is, I guess, psychology, someone that is more like yourself. So, so I'm not saying a man would only hire a man. In fact, a lot of male founders I know desperately want female talent, but it's just not enough in the pipeline. So then what ends up happening is the shortlist that they've got to pick from ends up being exactly that 80% male 20% female and then you simply have to pick the right person so I don't think we should force fit a woman into a job if she isn't the right fit but where we can we need a lot of I think policy changes to encourage younger women when they're 16 to then also address you know women who obviously filter out of technology to raise a family and then find it hard to break back in um, and then there is an awareness piece here that actually it is a very female friendly sector um, and it isn't just lots of 23 year old male coders with hoodies on typing away at code um, and lastly, Maria, there are lots of avenues into tech that don't require coding. 
I can't code. I'm not an engineer, but I can really get down and dirty with tech and get under the hood. And I'm quite technical, but you don't have to be. You could be a journalist. You could be a speaker, a broadcaster. Uh, you could be in marketing. Or yes, ideally, you could be the tech founder or you know, the person that's creating some of this fantastic innovation. And the bit you missed out, of course, is the other thing that every, uh, the, the young yeah. ladies need is they, yeah. they need role models like you. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so you. that's brilliant. So thank you for doing that. So that's really interesting. And, and, and I agree. So obviously you're, you're looking at uh, what's happening, what's coming up. What are the big trends you're seeing at the moment? What are the hot buttons? that we Oh, should my be God. Using? How much time do you have? <laughs> well, probably not long enough to cover all yeah, of them. I know. I know. <laughs> um, so if, if maybe if I pick out three of them, I think the first one is one, it's one that really lights my fire. It's. Um, within artificial intelligence, you know, everyone is obsessed with AI. A lot of brands will come to me and say, how do I do AI? And I'm thinking, well, first of all, there's a, there's a couple of myths out there. We actually aren't experiencing true AI at the moment. Okay, so we're experiencing artificial general intelligence, AGI, because true AI is a state of autonomy where it doesn't require human intervention and that algorithm or the machine can actually think for itself. It can discern between right and wrong it has, for example, ingrained in it or programmed into it ethics and consciousness, which we can't do yet. Machines and algorithms cannot replicate that easily at the moment, and they do get it wrong quite often. Um, but within AI is a strand that I think is very realistic, and this is called cognitive computing or effective computing. And this is, I've ended up sort of calling it emotive AI to make it much more colloquial. And it's simply a piece of software or an algorithm that can actually hear, perceive, and then respond to human emotion and quite accurately as well. So it is able, for example, to understand the nuances of human conversation, to get a really good sense of the inflections and intonations in a person's voice, to be able to have a really high-end computer vision software that allows the front-facing camera of your phone, for example, to enable the algorithm to pick up what kind of mood you're in and acknowledge that and, and play that back to you and then contextualize the conversation because that's the part that's still missing from a lot of AI tools is it's still a bit stilted. And this is where I think we will go, these emotive uses of AI. There's some phenomenal examples out there. Another one is mixed reality, and this is primarily in the workplace. There's still, and in fact, there's currently a massive war for talent, right? And you've got lots of scary statistics, like 60% of jobs that people want to hire for today with digital skills will take more than four months just to fill one role. And even then, the turnover of the person in that role is significant. So a lot of people aren't staying in these roles either. And a lot of the regular traditional companies or non-tech sector companies are bleeding talent to the startups and the tech giants because a lot of people with digital skills want to work there for culture, for environment, for perks, things like that. Um, so mixed reality, I think, will really help, especially incumbents and other sectors that aren't necessarily the Googles and the Amazons of the world, to be able to have a much more equitable playing field when it comes to attracting next generation talent, retaining them, upskilling your existing talent, because let's not forget about those of us that are in the workforce already, whether you're in your 30s, 40s or 50s or even older, you need to be able to be a bit more future ready or future proof. Um, and I think mixed reality tools, such as a HoloLens device, will allow you to create a sense of immersion in the workplace such that you can have people brainstorming in real time across three different countries, manipulating the same data, blueprinting the same items, and being able to iterate and create products and services much more rapidly than ever before. You've also got this being used in onboarding. You know, when you have orientation and you have employees coming into the firm, uh, people apparently see a 55% dropout with bad onboarding processes and organizations where that person leaves within three months if they don't feel those first three months have gone really well. And so you're seeing these tools being used there as well. So that's another trend, walking into work and having your desktop no longer necessarily be a hard kind of tangible item, but actually a minority report-esque, four or five screens hovering anywhere, uh, having virtual assistance for every person rather than just senior management. And I suppose the third one is the future of cybersecurity. We uh, all want to understand where digital identity is going. 
how the heck are we going to keep ourselves safe online? We don't want our data compromised. And of course, from an enterprise perspective, those repercussions are phenomenal. Financial risk, reputation, brand equity, losing consumer data. Um, and a lot of businesses, in fact, SMEs, 18, in 18 months after a cyber data track and breach, they stand to actually lose a significant part of revenue. And startups, in fact, can stand to even go out of business completely because they can't withstand the effects of it. So future forms of security where we use our biology to tell a system that you are you in the same way you use your fingerprint or facial recognition to unlock your phone, a much more advanced version of this that will actually identify you based on your heartbeat pattern with a simple item like a Fitbit or incorporating it into an Apple Watch or indeed your smartphone eventually. Um, and indeed vein recognition, which is different from fingerprints, where it looks at the subdermal patterns of the veins under your skin um, because fingerprint scanning is actually very, very easy to spoof. So it's future forms of all of these things that are realistic, that are not going to break the bank to deploy either from a business or from a consumer's perspective, I think will significantly transform how we interact with the digital world. My goodness, there's so many questions after that. That's incredible. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can focus yeah. on a couple. Yeah. You mentioned with regards to AI, the problem of ethics. Yeah. Um, that it, I think that is the problem, isn't it? What, what, what are the aspects that you see as being problematic with regards to ethics? So I think I see two or three significant aspects. One is the very nature of AI is based on data, right? So it's the basic source of it that underpins it all is the information that you start with, that you feed it. And at that stage itself, if the integrity of your data is compromised, your data itself is misleading, not quite right, it's skewed, it's biased that will eventually find its way into the programming part of it and hence the output or what the system actually does for you the second is once you've got the data in the system saying to this algorithm if this then this if this then this you know and so the system then learns and if it's a deep neural network it learns very very fast but it's learning from the data sets you feed it it's also learning from the person that's coding it and this is something that's a lot in the mainstream now the biases, both industrial biases as well as personal biases, that find its way into this programming then raises these ethical concerns. And I think the third really is the overall ethics of, for example, uh, legal entities and rights. So if we've got, for example, humanoid robots, socially assistive humanoid robots that are now finding its way in the UK into hospitals, into care homes, into schools to help autistic children, to help people with physical rehab, to help the elderly at home and things like that, um, we need to be really careful that we need to have a kill switch. What if the algorithm that's powering it goes rogue, which is very much a possibility. So the ethics of when something goes wrong, either with an algorithm or with an actual four foot five robot that has programming built into it, where does that legal kind of responsibility actually lie? And should we, in fact, give legal entity status to robots? I don't believe we should. But there's a lot of ethical questions like that to do with responsibility, to do with bias, and to do with uh, the legality of it all. That's fascinating, really <laughs> fascinating. Um, so, and, and one of the other things you touched on, you sort of gave us examples of what the future of work might look like. And, and you believe that this particular topic is actually really crucial right now, that people should be thinking about uh, the future of jobs, the future of work. Tell us a little bit more about why you think this is such a crucial topic. So the future of jobs is something A, I get asked about a lot, but actually one thing I'm doing right now is bringing up some research um, on my screen that I can pull out some really fascinating stats uh, for you for. And, 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 and some of these pieces of research really support the fact that A, a great deal of the jobs that will exist in the future don't exist today. So we've got to prepare the next generation and generations after them for this. But there's also something really fascinating about the nature of the jobs today. So there's converging demand for talent as it exists today. So it's close to 49% of all job postings by S&P 100 companies last year alone were for just 38 roles, right? So this is, this is actually really hyper kind of customized now and it's really kind of shrinking the, the variety and diversity of it. And all of these asked for 
very high demand skills such as data analysis and coding and, and being able to kind of understand these technical solutions. However, we also need to think conversely about the sort of skills that we will need and that will inform the future of jobs. And actually one of the pieces of research I often, I often quote with a great deal of confidence is the World Economic Forum roll out a future of jobs report each year. And, and one of the things they say is, first of all, this digital skills gap we're seeing is going to completely derail digital transformation at close to 55% of companies. But the skills that will be required are actually not just technical. So some of the things that we will need to actually keep to mind are that the jobs that are needed in the future will be things like, yes, it will call for understanding AI data and coding. The digital fluency, the digital dexterity will be critical. However, equally, the most high value work will also call for creative thinking, the ability to negotiate, the ability to influence other people, shock of shocks, you know, I mean, we, we are still in a people to people economy. So it isn't just about taking humans out of the equation. And so being able to apply ingenuity, invention, imagination, emotional intelligence will be just as important. And these kind of higher cognitive skills are something that software cannot replicate now. It, it might do three decades from now, but still there's no replacement for those sort of skills that we need. And Again, there's more research that shows that with two people having similar experience and the similar technical skills, what ends up giving one person the edge over the other is how they actually manage themselves and others, having that self-awareness, the empathy and the social skills. So I think a combination of digital dexterity with that will be critical. But if you aren't a coder, if this isn't your bag, if you know, you, you, you've, let's say, in your 50s and you've done the biggest bulk of your career, I get asked this a lot of time by the more mature employees, is, no, I don't think you're suddenly out of a job or you're suddenly competing with a 22-year-old who's an expert coder. I still think that experience, insight, and having that real ability to think in a very critical way and be able to examine these patterns and we won't go out of fashion. So long as you can work hand in hand with tools that are to do with AI and automation, to do with data science, to do with mixed reality, and you're comfortable with that digital fluency, I think you can still have a very, very secure career. That's good because I'm a little bit over 50 myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Uh, but, but anyway, so Shivi, when you're, you're brought in to speak to, to clients and to events, what are the things they're asking you for? What are the challenges they're facing? Or are they asking you for a general feeling of the future? Are, they, are, are you seeing specific requests? Yes, and, and, and I, I do like to sort of really get very, very um, specific and hyper-personalized on what are some of these things keeping my audience up at night. So often before I do an event, uh, from the organizer itself, the, my favorite question to ask is, what's keeping your audience up at night? What are the sort of stuff that really is, is, is burning, these burning questions on their mind um, that they would like the speaker to address rather than just giving a sort of overall view of digital transformation is coming and digital economy is growing. Well, so what, right? What does that mean for me? So I try and drill down very much into what's on their mind. And I think I'm noticing a couple of shifts. I think the first is there's a lot of questions about, right, so this is what I do in my organization. But, oh my gosh, I feel like there's other kind of, there's a wider remit I need to now know about in order to kind of stay relevant uh, to do with the digital world. So things like understanding data transparency and how your organization handles data both internally and externally, how to build public trust and faith between your stakeholders and yourself. Often a lot of people need to understand the nuances of doing that. Um, and then again, the ethics of these technologies, if you don't actually understand how to get under the hood of them, it's going to be really hard to work alongside them. So one is expanding your remit to look at the wider health and digital vitality, as I call it, of organizations. Another thing I get asked about a lot is very much what we've touched upon. What skills will I need to compete in the future? What jobs will exist in the future that don't exist now that I need to have on my radar? And actually, not just for myself, but for my children, for my children's children, just to make sure I prepare the next generation because we're all invested in our families as well. It isn't just about our own roles of work. So I get asked about that a lot. 
And I think the third thing I get asked, I suppose, possibly the, the biggest demand is, can you ex demystify for us what AI even means? What does it actually do? How does it work? Because it's bandied about so often. It's kind of an over-abused term. And things like disruptive innovation, you always hear AI. And people understand things like data and you know, virtual reality a lot more. But AI feels a bit abstract to a lot of people still. Even CTOs will often say to me, that was great. The fact that you really drilled down into these different strands of AI, but explain how they arrive at their outcome. Now I feel like I get it. And so I think these are three things that come up a lot. The one that's now coming up more and more, Maria, is, and I'm doing a talk next week in Rome on this, is Leadership 4.0 is trying to identify innovation philosophies and approaches and methodologies of leading that will help someone in a leadership capacity, it doesn't have to be C-suite, can even be a senior manager, take that team forward and stay relevant in the fourth industrial revolution. So what skills will I need in industry 4.0? Because how we used to lead and the constructs of leadership and hierarchy are just not gonna cut it anymore. Wow, wow. I mean, I'm, I was taking notes furiously. I've got notes everywhere here. So listen, I could talk to you all day and I'm aware we're, we're taking quite a bit of time. So I'm going to put you in my time machine as a futurist who are going to like this. And I'm going to take you back, knowing what you know now about the speaking industry, about your audiences, about your and your experience of speaking. What advice would you give to yourself starting out as a speaker? Wow. So I started out as a speaker, I want to say, 11 years ago. And what I would say to that version of me back then, and I was in my 20s then, was I suppose being in the industry I'm in, in technology, don't get in your head so much that you worry, for example, about the audience perceiving you as not having gravitas because you are young. So it's something that I battled with a lot when I started out. I was off the youngest person youngest speaker on stage and usually the only female and i do think there was a little bit of imposter syndrome where i thought oh my gosh should i even be here and then i do my talk and i go wait i know my stuff and i have people coming up and going that was fantastic we really you know got a really good understanding of, of, of what you do so i suppose they would be get out of your head people aren't obsessed with your gender or your age they want to hear what you have to say that's lovely i love that thank you shivi that was so much fun Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you for hosting me in your hot seat today. <laughs>